Welcome. Hi, I'm Mickey, and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners, and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness, and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Morning everyone, you're listening to Wikipedia. I'm Mickey, and this week on the podcast, I speak to a clinical and research metabolic neurologist, Dr. Matthew Phillips, on the utility of metabolic therapies for neurological health. Matt's introduction into metabolic therapy for neurological disorders is one of the first topics that we discuss after he sort of discovered that conventional treatment wasn't good enough to help stem the progression in certain neurological disorders such as Parkinson's and how this dissatisfaction led him on a journey to discover therapies outside of traditional medicine which could help people with neurological disorders such as Parkinson's, as I mentioned, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis and other neurological disorders. So we discuss all of this including the therapy behind ketogenic diets and fasting, the potential utility of this in brain cancer as well, and Dr. Phillips shares his clinical case study success and subsequent clinical trials in glioblastoma, an incurable brain cancer. As I mentioned, Dr. Phillips is also a researcher in addition to being a clinician, and we have popped links to where you can find Dr. Phillips on the internet, whereby you can also see his published peer-reviewed literature on these case studies, which is just awesome. So Dr. Phillips grew up in Canada and trained in Australia and completed his neurology training in Melbourne. And when he realized that there was no such route for being able to specialize in a particular neurological disorder or therapy, he in fact went on a journey of traveling around the world, working in different places for three years, creating his own sort of self-taught fellowship, during which he learned about a variety of therapeutic possibilities that he had never considered. And this is where this was the genesis for metabolic neurology, which is a term that he coined. On completing his three-year fellowship, he, it dawned on him that metabolic strategies, particularly fasting and ketogenic diets, were promising therapeutic options for a range of disorders. So he came back to the medical system in the Waikato and he put into practice a lot of the stuff that he has since published on and now works on to determine whether they are feasible, safe and can make an impact in terms of helping patients. And of course we discuss all of this in today's interview. So you can find Matt at metabolicneurologist.com and I think that you'll really get a lot from this conversation. Before we kick into it though, I'd just like to remind you the best way to support the podcast is to subscribe at your favourite podcast platform or wherever you listen to Wikipedia. This increases the visibility and awareness of Wikipedia to other people who can then learn from the experts that I bring in to talk to me. And also to remind you, early 2023, we launch the mini Wikipedia Monday episodes, which will either be solo episodes where I talk you through some practical nutrition tips, which a lot of you have been asking me for, and so I'm delighted to be able to start doing that. And also tiny little short form interviews where I just briefly talk to a an expert about something that they are interested in so um we are launching that in early 2023 so keep an eye out in your podcast platform for those to start dropping all right team for now though please enjoy this interview with dr matthew phillips matt Thank you so much for taking time to speak with me today. I have heard you on both the Precure podcast, Low Carb Down Under, um, and also, of course, um, my friend Grant speaks very highly of you and your work. So I'm really excited to dive into to that work. And I have actually spoken to a few people on brain metabolism and brain energy, including Chris Palmer and other people. And 
I feel like the, there may be some crossovers with what we talk about, but of course you'll be able to tell me that that is indeed the case. First and foremost, though, Matt, um, how did you, Canadian, who has also spent quite a bit of time in Australia, how have you ended up in Waikato? Uh, yep. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess I was born and grew up in Canada and decided to go to Australia in my 20s to study medicine. Probably just wanted some adventure more than anything and decided to stay there to uh, complete my neurology training and uh, worked there for a little bit one year as a neurologist. And after that, I I took two or well, three years, two or three years sort of uh, outside of the medical system, a uh, bit of traveling and, and other places in the world, and then uh, decided I wanted to return somewhere uh, within the medical system. And I thought New Zealand was a nice balance between Australia and Canada, and it had um, certain elements of the of the geography appealed to me and the, and the people appealed to me, and it seemed just like a nice place to go for one year. And here we are almost seven years later. <laughs> so that's, that's the long and the short of it. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And, um, you know, I mentioned um, Dr. Chris Palmer, who is, uh, focuses a lot of his work in that nutritional psychiatry sort of space. Um, and actually, can we just sort of start with that real sort of 101 as you sort of describing what a neurologist does because obviously it it uh, is about the brain, but I believe it's more than the brain that you sort of work on. Yes, uh, I think Chris Palmer uh, and I, uh, sees things m most similarly to me out of anyone else I know of. So there will be some overlap. Uh, but basically, a neurologist studies disorders of the brain. We don't actually study the brain itself. We study what happens when things go awry. And the typical disorders we see are stroke, epilepsy, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, nerve disorders, muscle disorders, so things outside of the brain and so on. A psychiatrist uh, deals with different disorders that pretty much exclusively involve the brain itself rather than the nerves or muscles. So they will deal with things like um, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and so on. And really... We both studied the brain, but I guess there's uh, very little uh, uh, apparent overlap in these disorders. But that probably just reflects how little we understand the brain more than anything else, I think. Perhaps one day we'll merge the two fields. And then, of course, there's other fields that study the brain, psychology and neuropsychology. If you ask me, those people probably study the brain itself more than neurologists or psychiatrists, like how the brain normally works. But still, uh, they're looking at it from yet another perspective. So it's like that um, parable of the elephant, you know, one, uh, the seven blind men and the elephant. One guy feels, you know, the, the leg and says, oh, it's a tree. And one guy feels the tail and says it's, I don't know, a snake or something like that. And really, uh, it's an elephant. None of them are seeing the big picture because they're only exposed to their certain point of view. Yeah. Okay. And um, in your work, um, I mean, you're a neurologist, but I, you know, your website says metabolic neurologist. So can you expand on that, Matt, and sort of that, how yeah. that differentiates you from someone else? Metabolic neurologist is a coin I termed a few years ago, just because I wanted to emphasize the metabolic aspect of neurology, which I think is very important very important and will become more important in the decades to come. So a neurologist uh, sort of deals with diagnosing neurological disorders and then trying to treat them usually with medications. A metabolic neurologist would still do those things and I do those things, it is my day job. However, I think a metabolic neurologist and I believe and I hope neurology in the future will recognize that Many of these disorders uh, in neurology and psychiatry, as, as Dr. Chris Palmer is trying to address, have an underlying uh, metabolic problem to them, uh, specifically mitochondria dysfunction. And we're really only going to make serious headway with many of them, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and there, there are many others, when we recognize that we have to Heal, uh, heal up, rejuvenate, restore the mitochondria, which 
really relies on metabolic strategies rather than medications. Although some medications could, can certainly do this too, but the most beneficial things for improving one's mitochondria would be these metabolic strategies like fasting and ketogenic diets, uh, caloric restriction, and so on. Mm, cool, and uh, and of course we'll we'll dive into those and how they can help with regards to the brain and neurology and and those conditions that you mentioned. Have they been increasing over the last 10, 20, 30 years, Matt? Like what is, this, what is the state of that sort of space? In general, the answer is yes. So just if you looked at the top causes of death, even 100, 50 to 100 years ago, they'd be rather different to what we have today. So 100 years ago, it was mainly infectious-based disorders, your pneumonias and other you know, infectious type things. And now... The top 10 causes of death in, in New Zealand and other similar countries are uh, atherosclerosis, which causes a lot of heart attacks and a number of strokes, cancer, which can definitely involve the brain, Alzheimer's, uh, and other similar disorders, including mental health illnesses. And then underlying all of it is uh, diabetes and these other uh, components of the metabolic syndrome, so raised body mass index, so being overweight or obese, hypertension, and so on, that predisposes a person to all these things. Now, to answer your question directly, yes, things like uh, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, they're definitely increasing. Alzheimer's is increasing at an alarming rate. I think it's doubling every 20 years or something like that. And that's very concerning because that is a very difficult disorder with a huge uh, impact on, on many people and society. Strokes are increasing, definitely, and that's concerning. That's probably the most common disorder we see at this moment. Uh, Parkinson's is increasing. Motor, things like motor neuron disease, which are rare but extremely troublesome, that's increasing too. So it seems uh, that most of these disorders probably have a lifestyle component because if you look at what's changed the most, Many things have changed in the last 50 years, but what's changed the most is our dietary lifestyle. Yeah. And that means two things mainly. Uh, it's not so much how much people are eating, although they're probably eating more, it, but it's more so how frequently we're eating and what we're eating. So we're eating many times throughout the day now, even compared to 50 years ago, and we're eating a lot more processed food, carbohydrate and fat, compared to 50 years ago. And I think these two things are really responsible for most of this epic rise of diabetes and all the other lifestyle disorders that we're seeing today. Mm, I was just actually listening on a run this morning to Peter Atia. So he had, and I, I believe you know who I'm talking about. I know and, Peter, uh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he was, it was his AMA on insulin resistance because he had a, he re-released an episode with, um, I'm going to say it was Jerry, I can't recall his last name, um, which was so like, uh, complex that they then sort of did a, a bit of a breakdown on, on another episode and they were talking that you know over or close to 90 percent of the U.S. population have some element of that metabolic syndrome and you know insulin resistance which I've heard people talk about Alzheimer's as being sort of type 3 diabetes and I think that that might be a little bit too simplistic for as I understand Alzheimer's actually is but it really does speak to that our ability to, or the availability of fuel, if you like, in the body and the, and the way that we utilize fuel is really compromised. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, that number you said, 90% plus of people have some element of poor metabolic health. I, I would agree with that. I mean, in New Zealand, we're probably looking at about a third of the population at least has prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. Probably about two thirds of the population is overweight or obese, and one third of the population is obese. And these numbers are, uh, I'm pulling these from, you know, two or three year old data. So it's yeah. probably a little more now. And this is very concerning because people can sort of manage pre diabetes and even type 2 diabetes and being overweight or obese isn't a big deal for quite some time. But these things uh, predispose you to the nastier disorders, such as Alzheimer's and cancer, heart disease, and so on. Those are the things that really hurt your quality of life. And of course, they can lead to um, a decreased length of life. 
So this this is a sort of, to my mind, the true pandemic um, of met of poor metabolic health that afflicts afflicts most people in the Western world, and th th it's it's still not readily uh, understood or acknowledged. I don't think by by many people in the medical system. Yeah, and um, of course, the last three years, or let's let's probably not three years, maybe two years, has not helped. The situation to my mind with regards to the focus on things like washing your hands which I don't think is you know this is not a bad thing you know wash your hands sanitize social distance from people as opposed to hey you've got to look after your metabolic health because of that relationship between yeah. you know your immune yeah, system the elephant in the room with the whole covid uh thing it, it's very interesting this is an opportunity this to me is an opportunity where people should actually have realized that the people getting the sickest are those with poor metabolic health the people that are hospitalized are the people with the type 2 diabetes the people who are obese the people who have other lifestyle related disorders and yet we still haven't really given this enough recognition and understanding and and cla i mean it's just amazing if you if you have metabolic health the, the chances that the you know a virus covid or any other will put you in hospital are, is remote and as for the hand washing that's very interesting because you know when hand washing was originally suggested by uh, dr Semmelweis uh several hundred years ago as as a as a good thing to do and that's universally acknowledged as a good thing to do he was ridiculed for about 50 years before it actually came out that yes perhaps hand washing is helpful you know people didn't believe it for a long time. And I believe, I, I think this is the, the similar thing is going to happen here. We'll see in a few decades, I hope, that really if you, your best defense against uh, COVID-19 or any other virus really is just having good metabolic health and letting your immune system just deal with it and having a healthy body that doesn't get riled by these things. But we're not there. We're nowhere near there yet. It's going to be some time before we realize this, I think, on a global global level. Uh, I, I agree, and I often liken it to um, the shift that happened with smoking and how long that seemed to take. Um, Another good example, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, Matt, as a metabolic neurologist, what led you down this path as opposed to the more conventional sort of treatment and therapy that um, obviously I imagine you still deal with, but yeah, how did your interests develop here? I, I think... Uh, and I've said this story several times before, when I finished my neurology training, I was very dissatisfied with the fact that I knew how to diagnose and 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 sort of uh, understand neurological disorders to, to a certain level. And yet I I didn't feel like I had the power to improve the disorder at a, at a deep level. I could start some medications for many of them, but all that really did was patch up their symptoms and only temporarily. A lot of neurological disorders are, 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 I think they are the most difficult disorders in the world in general. Uh, things like um, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, motor neuron disease, uh, you know, brain cancer and so on. These are very difficult, terrible things to be afflicted with. And I, I wanted to find a better treatment for them. So I chose not to specialize in any tip, you know, I, I did uh, specialize in, in a in sort of nerve and muscle disorders, how to how to measure them. You know, I did I did some subspecialty training, but then rather than uh, carry on down that road, I, I took off for a couple of years and just thought about how could I help people with these neurological disorders the best. And I, I delved into many different things, and I, I took a, a couple of years to be honest. But it, eventually, the sort of fasting keto space appealed to me the most as the most potentially powerful and dramatic of all the things I'd read. And, learned about and and then I decided to come to Waikato and, and uh, it just changed my whole outlook and uh, we started the Parkinson's trial and, and it took off from there. Okay and um, obviously you're you know there, there aren't that many people who do what you do how well received are the, your methods in your field like and amongst other colleagues or um, the general population? Yeah, so most people have difficulty understanding what a neurologist does on a daily basis, let alone a metabolic neurologist. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, amongst neurology colleagues, which I, I believe is uh, what you're referring to, um, it's still it's, it's a, the whole metabolic aspect using fasting and ketogenic diets is, is still very, um, it's intriguing to most of them, but it's still very foreign. And I think a lot of them are still unsure how to take it. 
Um, I present every year to sort of the annual neurology conference in New Zealand, and uh, there's definitely some interest, but there's also uh, some skepticism, I think. And that's actually, I probably get a bit more skepticism from my own neurology colleagues throughout the country than than many other people. And actually, I, I think that's a good thing. I like that because neurologists are very critical, analytical, skeptical people in general. That's the kind of person that becomes a neurologist. And if I, they've often pointed out things that make me think deeply and, you know, often very good points that I have to address. And it, it actually just makes you, uh, you know, think about your theories and what you're saying a bit more. And, and so I, I really appreciate it, although at the time it's often uh, a bit disheartening or, or uh, you know, that people aren't there. There's not sort of taking this on board more. But ultimately, I think my neurology colleagues are sort of uh, neutral to weakly supportive. Uh, the ones at Waikato are, are very supportive. But in general, yeah, it's, it's still a little bit uh, left of field for them. Yeah. Well, then, as a complete skeptic, as because you've just described yourself almost in that same sort of vein, what was it that made you, um, that was your light bulb moment? Was there a light bulb moment where you're like, actually, this could make a difference? Yeah, there was a light bulb. Oh, there were several light bulb moments, but a big one I remember was Myanmar in 2015 in uh, late March, uh, where I, I'd just been, Myanmar, uh, known as Burma be beforehand, you know, it's a, it's a really nice place. Not, not wasn't too touristy when I went there. There weren't many people. And I, I just had a lot of time to myself. And I remember being in this place called Miao U, where I just was on top of a hill looking over, looking some really ancient ruins. And I thought, was just trying to, I said to myself, I'm going to stay on this hill until the sun goes down and I'll, I'll stay as long as I need to into the dark until I have some kind of idea about what I want to do. And yeah, it took, I think it happened before the sunset, thankfully. And I, I, I just thought maybe start with people with Parkinson's and maybe if I could somehow adjust their whole metabolic state to somehow enhance their brain metabolism that, and maybe that could actually really help these people with Parkinson's. And that was the genesis really of, of the Parkinson's dietary study, which we did the following year. I, I think there's lots of light bulb moments. There's also lots of moments of despair and, you know, things not working out as the way you want, but that just describes, uh, I think uh, the fact that you're probably on a good path in life when you have peaks and valleys, you know, um, and, uh, you know, there's highs and there's lows and that's, uh, really inevitable. If you have highs, you're going to have lows. If you don't have highs, you probably don't have lows. And it means you're on some sort of mundane path where maybe you're not really doing much. So yeah, that was, that was it. I, I hope I get more aha moments and I'm sure there will be more lows as well. Yeah. Okay. No, that's, that's great, Matt. So you mentioned brain metabolism and that that's the thing that you would, the problem you were trying to solve. Can you describe why that is important. What is it about your brain metabolism that then impacts on um, the progression of these conditions? Okay. So metabolism is basically the sum of all the sort of biochemical reactions in the body. And so every cell has, you know, metabolism in working inside of it, doing things to keep the cell going. Now, neurons require virtually more energy than any other cell. Muscle cells are pretty energy demanding too. And both of them rely heavily on these batteries that are in virtually all cells called mitochondria. Now, the mitochondria, there are hundreds or thousands of them in any cell, certainly in neurons. Now, although they're known, although they're known as batteries, uh, they actually do a whole lot of other things. So the mitochondria zip in and around the neurons, and some of these neurons are up to a meter long. They go up and down the neuron. They go into all these tiny spaces. And what they do is, yes, they produce most of the energy for the cell. However, they also sort of control, probably control and command the cell metabolism, and they determine where our resources are allocated. They determine epigenetics, which is which genes in the neurons are switched on and which genes are switched off. They're probably the main controllers of that, actually, newer data is showing. They also uh, are profoundly important in the release of, of neurotransmitters throughout the brain, so your dopamine, your serotonin, your acetylcholine, and norepinephrine, and so on. And these are the, you know, these are the fundamental cell-to-cell um, -cell communication um, sort of molecules they're just so important in in making your brain function optimally so mitochondria can also tell um 
tell certain cells when it's time to self-destruct because maybe they're old and junky. And they can also uh, tell mitochondria that are old and junky when it's time to self-destruct. That's called mitophagy. And they can also activate the genesis of new mitochondria. That's called mitochondria biogenesis. So they just do so many things. And I think we're only really realizing the importance of mitochondria. And I, I guess they... I see them as the core of metabolic health. If you want to define what makes a person healthy, it's optimized mitochondria function. And that is a very different definition from what most people define as health. I think a lot of people confuse fitness with health. And fitness is, for the most part, a different thing. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes that makes perfect sense. And then so what is it about that mitochondria dysfunction that then um, progresses say, Alzheimer's from Parkinson's? Is it just where that happens in the brain? Or Yeah, I, I believe so. It's a good question, and nobody really knows the answer. But So if we look at Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's likes to go for two brain structures known as the neocortex and the hippocampus, whereas Parkinson's likes to go for the brain stem, a particular region known as the substantia nigra. But it also goes uh, to parts of the cortex, so, sort of a different pattern of cortex. And it likes to go for neurons in the gut. So they, they affect sort of different neurons. And if you look at motor neuron disease, it affects motor, the big motor neurons, which are different. And uh, if you look at glioblastoma, which is a, a, the most common primary brain cancer, it goes for the support cells around the neurons. So all these disorders are, are involving, are tied together by mitochondria dysfunction, but they're affecting different regions of uh, the body. And we're, we're sticking to the brain ones, obviously. But I think it depends where your mitochondria become dysfunctional first, and that determines what kind of uh, lifestyle disorder you're going to get. So if you get the dysfunction in the hippocampus, maybe Alzheimer's is going to be uh, the most likely one that comes later on. If you get dysfunction in the brainstem, maybe Parkinson's. And there are many different things that can damage these mitochondria. Given the, the rise of the lifestyle disorders in the last 50, last 50 years, I think it's our dietary lifestyle that's the number one responsible factor. However, there are many other factors, um, pollution, uh, smoking, um, chemo, uh, sort of chemical carcinogens, radiation, viruses, you name it. There's many things that can damage them, but they can renew. And that's why fasting and keto diets are so important because they promote that renewal process. Yeah. And before we dive into that, just quickly, what about the genetic basis for these conditions? Like, for example, if someone's father has Alzheimer's, are they much more likely to develop it or, question, or you know. a little bit more likely? Or The answer is yes, they are more likely. Now, but it's probably not based on genetics. So 5 to 10% of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's has a strong genetic basis. Um, but the vast majority of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's is called sporadic. There's, it's no real strong genetic basis. But they're still more likely to get it if they have a father or mother with it. However, people who grow up in the same family pretty much always share a very similar environment. They eat the same kind of food. They eat the same number of times during the day. They're doing the same things. So again, that's all going to affect the epigenetics of how the genes are expressed, which ones are turned on and which ones are turned off. And of course, if you've got the wrong ones turned off on and the wrong one, the, the right ones turned off, then you, you may be, go, you're going to see an increased prevalence of Alzheimer's or whatever in that family. That's not based on the genetics. Um, I couldn't give you uh, specific numbers. Uh, I think the numbers are not well understood in terms of how likely one is to get Alzheimer's if they have a parent that has it or Parkinson's, but you can see various estimates. Uh, it's still not great, but you know, relative to other people, the risk might be increased, but you're absolutely significantly, but your overall absolute risk is still very low. Yeah. Okay. And I can, and as you were talking about epigenetics, I was thinking about uh, adults of reproductive age living in a state of, you know, insulin resistance without really knowing it, then having children, then that's obviously impacting on their potential health sort of outcomes. Definitely. And I feel like, yeah. 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 So, you know, the uh, insulin resistance is an interesting one. I you know, you know, people, First people, I guess it, it's a matter, a matter of how deeply you look at things. Like a lot of people think, oh, sugar is the enemy and sugar is the main problem. Well, yes, from a, a certain point of view, it is. However, if you go deeper, it's not so much the sugar. It's the fact that we've got insulin resistance developing. 
so if you get that in the liver and organs, then you're, you're predisposing yourself to type 2 diabetes. But really, why is the insulin resistance developing? Is you know you got to go deeper than that even. And I think uh, you could. It's not known, but I see the insulin resistance as some kind of uh, mechanism elicited by these cells to prevent damage to their mitochondria. If you are overloading these mitochondria with glucose and, and fats, in fact, the combination of sugar and, and fat is probably the worst thing, and that's the Western diet. It's not just the sugar. It's the combination. They attack the, the mitochondria from two different pathways, and you have to get this metabolic gridlock that really induces a huge amount of uh, free radical formation, really makes life difficult for the mitochondria. And so I, I see the insulin resistance as this compensatory thing, almost a defensive measure to just you know, prevent this from happening. And of course, the glucose then goes up in the blood and then the blood, you know, the pancreas increases insulin to try and get rid of it. So you get more going in the cell and you get this, this C sign uh, fight between um, the, the blood glucose and the intracellular glucose and the insulin resistance keeps going up. And eventually the whole thing just gets out of control and then your mitochondria get dysfunctional and damaged and nastier diseases are around the corner. So it depends how deeply you want to look at things. It's it's very, uh, I'm very careful when I say, oh, this, this is due to one thing. But um, I do hinge on the mitochondria as the most, uh, as the best thing to hinge on, because you could go deeper than them. You could say, oh, well, it's the diet that's ultimately causing that. But we can actually improve the mitochondria, the targeted strategies. And I think that's why it's good to focus on them as the key, the keystone of metabolic health. Yeah. So can we then, Matt, um, move to those strategies and just can you briefly outline why ketogenic diets, fasting, and potentially the utility of fasting mimicking diets, like how do they impact our mitochondria? Yes. So fasting, it's just abstaining from food for at least 12 hours. Um, anything sort of 12 to 48 hours is intermittent fasting. Anything over 48 hours is a periodic or prolonged fasting. So three, four, five day fasts. And then fasting mimicking diet is in there too. It's periodic fasting. Um, that's where you have, you know, very, very calorie restricted meals, uh, for long periods of time. And it, all of these things put the body into this fasted state where you get, uh, a lot of changes, uh, ketosis, of course, where the body makes these ketones from fat, body fat, but the fasted state is aimed at basically restoring mitochondria. If you look at what it's doing, that's, to, to my mind, the most advantageous aspect of it. The ketogenic diet is a high-fat, low-carb diet that mimics the fasted state. It, it, the main difference is that the body's getting the fat from, its, from the diet rather than the body fat. There's more differences between them than that, but I think it's very useful to tie these two strategies together as sharing a common function. And of course, the ketogenic diet also enhances mitochondria function. So between the two of them, you have probably the two best tools available for enhancing mitochondria health uh, through a number of mechanisms. And thereby, potentially, if, if it's true that lifestyle disorders are mainly caused by poor mitochondria health, that is the best tool for restoring um, the health of these neurons and, and other cells in these disorders. Mm. And how do they help the mitochondria? Two mechanisms, uh, main ones. So metabolism consists of anabolism and catabolism. Anabolism is building up the body. Catabolism is breaking it down. If you look at our hunter-gatherer evolutionary lifestyle, which was two to three million years, it, we had much less anabolism, building stuff up, and much more catabolism, breaking stuff down, because we had fewer meals, long fasting periods, and what we ate did not have a whole lot of processed sugar in it. So it wasn't like this huge um, glucose hit to the bloodstream that would result in a lot of free radical production and uh, glycation end product production and so on, which the mitochondria have to deal with. So you had this, this state that's changed in the last 50 to 100 years dramatically, where we now have multiple meals a day and there's a lot of processed carbs and we're just uh, throw, you know, we're basically overemphasizing the anabolic periods and we have removed mostly the catabolic periods. We have insufficient fasting periods. And when we do eat, it's just too much uh, for the mitochondria to metabolize. Now, the anabolic periods, if they're excessive, are problematic because they basically um, induce, uh, like I said, a lot of, uh, in the Western diet anyways, fat, 
uh, fatty acids and also glucose upon the mitochondria, creating this gridlock and a lot of free radical production. That, and these free radicals can be dealt with for a while, and they do have beneficial signaling functions as well. However, when there's too many of them, it's, it's damaging to the mitochondria and cell. You get damage throughout the cells. At the same time, we have inadequate cat cat catabolic periods because, and that's important because those are the periods where the mitochondria can undergo biogenesis and renew, and we can break down the old ones that need to go away because they're producing too many free radicals, they're not efficient. Uh, so that's mitophagy. So we, it's so important to implement fasting and keto diets for people with these disorders because it allows you to mitigate the anabolic um, injury uh, to the mitochondria and cells, and it allows the mitochondria to rejuvenate during the catabolic fasting periods in particular, but also the keto diet to a, a lesser extent. That's why it's so important. Mm. Mitophagy and autophagy, are they the same process, but just in different cells? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Autophagy, uh, mitophagy is like a subset of autophagy. Autophagy means cell eating or recycling. So that would be autophagy re would relate to the cell in general. You can break down an entire cell or most of the cell and recycle its components into newer things. Mitophagy is just that process as applied specifically to mitochondria. Mm. And your like as I understand it, um, autophagy is like a lot of people come to fasting and come to ketogenic diets talking about autophagy. Like I want to upregulate my autophagy, and for all of the reasons that you've just described, what's your understanding of the um, not the possibility to do that, but you know how long would it take in your mind, Matt, for someone to sort of achieve what they're trying to do, or is that not even? Is that not even possible? Like, what's your what are your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, it's a million dollar question. Uh, I don't know is the answer. I get that asked. I get asked that a lot. And uh, look, it's mainly theoretical. We don't have the evidence to say, oh, it's autophagy kicks in at this point in time uh, with this uh, level of fasting or keto diet. And I'm sure it would vary from one person to the next. And it would probably vary with tissue type as well. Uh, but if you look at like. Uh, Studies by fasting uh, scientists, uh, Walter Longo, for example, probably uh, significant autophagy, whatever that means, would need at least a three or four day fast to, to become upregulated to a degree where you're getting a lot of it. And that doesn't mean that uh, eating one meal a day or, or time-restricted feeding like the 16 and 8 or, or just a keto diet by itself isn't going to induce it. But... I, I feel confident when I have patients do a four or five day fast that we've we've elicited some significant degree of autophagy, and I only use those fasts uh, mainly for my patients with um, advanced cancer. Mm, okay, and actually, that was going to be my next. Well, is my next question is how do you choose the protocol for your particular uh, patient or condition? Is it based on the person and their or is it based on what you understand would be most beneficial? It's a bit or of both, both, but mainly I target the disorder. It's guesswork, really. I mean, I, I just don't know because we have so little evidence for this. We, we, uh, we're using um, protocols that are much more intense than most people. Um, we, we've used ketogenic diet protocols, like plain old keto diet protocols for our Alzheimer's and Parkinson's patients, but for our cancer patients, it's much more intense, big fasts and so on. I think if you have an aggressive illness that is associated with a shortened lifespan, such as glioblastoma multiform. These people have, on average, with the best treatment, 12 to 15 years, uh, months, sorry, 12 to 15 months um, to live on average. You know, 50% are, are no longer with us after that period of time. And so for that condition, I think one has to use more intense metabolic strategies, such as the multi-day fasts plus a keto diet, plus intermittent fasting time restriction of the keto diet. If you have a disorder that lasts for uh, years uh, or even a couple decades, such as Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, you have more time. And many of these patients are, are older. Uh, and is it as advantageous to use a five-day fast with them? I don't know, but maybe a ketogenic diet on its own is good enough. And that way we can ensure we get good nutrient density into them as, as well at least more regular nutrient density. And so 
it's it's guesswork, but I guess I'm just thinking of the disorder most most of the time, and uh, that that sort of guides me. Now, if you're just talking about uh, rever- putting type two diabetes into remission or something, then someone who's got a lot of body fat, they I know they handle these long fasts a lot better than others, and so they might just be absolutely fine after seven days of fasting and, and typically want to keep going. But someone who's thin and has type two diabetes, which is possible they may not tolerate the long fast as well, in which case maybe I just want to use a ketogenic diet instead. So patient does matter too. Yeah, it's interesting you say that about um, someone with excess body fat tolerating it. And I'm just in my head thinking physically that's probably not an issue, but I wonder what psychologically a prolonged fast for someone, um, how, I mean, that takes a lot of uh, sort of determination to do the hard stuff in order to fix their condition. Whereas, um, yeah, I think that person has to be super motivated. The psychology is the key component, actually. When you think about what we're doing, like with the glioblastoma patients, we got about 10 of them now doing, you know, you take them from a three meals a day plus snacks, high carbohydrate eating pattern. And now I'm saying to them, you're going to do a five day fast every month. You're going to eat once a day, sometimes twice, and it's going to be a ketogenic diet. It's a massive, massive lifestyle change. So even though they're motivated already because they, you know, we have a terminal condition here with no treatment options of any considerable note that that results in any significant life extension, changing the psychology is the key component. And if you do that, I, I find I don't have to do much. The patient will guide themselves along. Yes, there are hiccups where you know you have to help. They fall down. You have to help pick them up. But as we do this, the more and more I could leave most of those patients today now and not talk to them again, and they would continue doing it. And so changes in psychology makes is, is everything. What a person believes is everything. That's how the brain works. And changing their psychology means helping them understand that actually eating once or twice a day and eating a ketogenic meal is probably closer to how we evolved and it's closer to normal than the current dietary pattern is. For most people, this is uh, almost everyone, I would say, no matter where they their ancestors are from, this is a much more natural way to be. And mm. if that switch can really be made, uh, it doesn't happen in one setting usually, then then, then the, and the person understands why, they can do the how, which is, you know, following along the plan that we have. Yeah, for sure. Matt, you published a case study on a woman called Serona, and I believe that you've also um, sort of talked about her in, in some of your presentations. Are you able to describe for our listeners um, the that case study? And for, you know, we'll obviously put your links in the show notes that you have it um, published on your website as well, I understand. Yeah, sure. So Serona... Uh, what well is is a young lady who uh presented to me gosh it's five and a half years ago now with a metastatic thymoma which is a you know stage four terminal cancer i was senior for a neurological disorder called myasthenia gravis and so it was just sort of incidental i saw her a couple of weeks after the diagnosis and and basically uh, she'd be given about a year to live by her oncologist with chemotherapy and surgery and radiation were not an option. It was just the tumor was the size of a small football, too too big and complicated to do anything about, really. So there was very really no hope there. And she mentioned this. I mean, I saw it on the scan before I, I saw her for the review. And we talked about what she was doing. And I just thought, well, gosh, you've you've got zero hope here. She's been given, no matter what she does, you know, the outlook is bad. Mm. So I just met, we just started talking about metabolic approaches. And I said, well, you know, one, this is a consideration. And she was actually looking for something. She just didn't know what or, or how to find it. And uh, I guess I was looking f- for perhaps a patient brave enough with no options. And so it, it was, it, it worked very well. And she embarked on this sort of seven day fasting uh, protocol every one to two months with a keto diet in between. Mm-hmm. She it was a two to three meal a day keto diet. We we didn't restrict it in the first couple of years, and she just followed that. And after a couple of years, the, the the course was bumpy. It wasn't like smooth sailing. And and uh, you know I'm still thinking about what exactly happened. But at the end of the day, the tumor 
reduced in size by 96%. And although it's sort of uh, oscillated, it, it gets a little bigger at times and, and smaller at times, it's still very much smaller than it was. And she's got a great quality of life and really, you know, we're, we're at five and a half years and she's not terminal or palliative in any sense of the word. Wow. So yeah, I guess, like you said, read the paper if you want to see more. Yeah, yeah. And is that a typical response in your clinic, Matt? And I know that nothing is typical. No, so, that's the yeah. first in the world. That's Yeah, amazing. No one's ever applied a fasting keto diet protocol in the absence of chemo standard cancer treatments to a patient with a stage four cancer and had that kind of result. Um, not to my knowledge. It's uh it's it's a serious outlier. But but I think it's really important to study outliers. Something amazing happened. And I suspect the fasting keto diet was certainly a, a part of that, potentially the big part. Other possibilities are though that you know fasting keto augment the immune system. So maybe the immune system got augmented, and that's really good against cancer because the immune system can uh can help you uh eradicate tumors. Uh, another possibility is that she was put on a drug called prednisone for the last couple months that could have reduced part of the tumor. There's, these tumors are complicated and some of the components are non-cancerous. It could have reduced the bulk of the tumor. Uh, but I think the, the result was so profound. I, I, and prednisone doesn't help really with cancer in general. I don't think that was a big thing. So, yeah, that's that it's it's just one of those cases where I think um, it spurred me to do this glioblastoma trial when I were, we're implementing a proper protocol to a bunch of people. And, you know, if that works in these people, then that's difficult really to argue against in any sense of the word. Mm. And uh, if people have a uh, um, glioblastoma, is that a terminal um, prognosis? So Yeah, it's terminal. It's it's. It's a terrible diagnosis to get. And these people are usually in their 40s or 50s, some in their 60s. You know, it's like, like I said, uh, half of people are deceased after 12 to 15 months. But that, and that's with the optimal care. If you don't get that care, it's less, less by a couple of months. The, the, the optimal care consists of surgery, chemo, uh, therapy, and radiation. And that all combined gives you probably an extra two, maybe three months on average. Plus, you've got potential side effects. So it's it's really a terrible thing to get. And, um, of course, it's got other problems. It generates seizures, and it affects your thinking in a lot of people. And it's just not good. So, And, Matt, because I, um, I understand that fasting is a recommended, um, well, in some circles, uh, therapy to go alongside chemo and radiation to help protect the healthy cells as well and i imagine that obviously is is um well, what you were talking about probably with the immune system and and its ability to upregulate that right yeah so these these protocols have uh, a variety of potentially beneficial effects against cancer so the first one obvious one is you're you're knocking down your blood glucose levels which is the primary fuel for cancer um, through the Warburg effect, which is this fact that cancer cells upregulate their glucose intake by 10 to 100 times. They, they basically need glucose. And at the same time, you're elevating ketones in the body, which normal cells can use, but cancer cells, there's really no good evidence that they can use those to grow and produce. Yeah. So you're, you're surrounding them with this alternate fuel source that your normal cells can happily switch to, but the cancer cells sort of remain stuck in growth mode, but there's insufficient fuel or less fuel. Um, at the same time, when you do that, you the, the normal cells, because they realize that there's less glucose and less nutrients in general coming in, particularly with the fasting, they will hunker down into this stress-resistant state and become more resilient against multiple stressors, including chemotherapy and radiation. And there is some preliminary evidence for this in humans. At the same time, that's called differential stress resistance because the cancer cells can't do that. They keep having to grow. They, they must grow. That's what they do. They can't stop growing. They're cancer. You also induce uh, differential stress sens sensitization, which indicates that the cancer cells may become more sensitive to chemo and radiation compared to the normal, normal cells because of that reason as well. And of course, underlying all of this, the fasting keto diet approach is to restore the mitochondria, not just in the cancer cells, which, you know, let's face it, some of them may be too far gone. You might have to destroy them with your 
chemo and radiation, but perhaps other cells elsewhere in the organ that so that you can avoid recurrences. Recurrences is, uh, are what often gets you. you. You treat the primary tumor, tumor okay, and then you get a recurrence somewhere else 12 months later, and that goes out of control. So there's multiple layers to these strategies with cancer, as there are with other disorders. Yeah. I'd not actually heard that there was not good evidence for ketones being a fuel source for cancer. In fact, I thought that there are tumors that can sort of change change their um I don't know, shape if you like, and then well not shape's not the right word, but and then yeah. be able to use ketones. So is that evidence not as the solid as what is, we might? Th this is a convoluted space and there's some evidence, uh particularly on I think um melanoma cells and uh believe maybe prostate cancer cells that they uh have been shown to utilize ketones. But in terms of using the ketones to grow in a person, that's not been shown to my knowledge. And a lot of this work, gotta remember, is done in vitro in in the lab or in animals. And translating that to what happens in vivo in a person is it's it's so uh one must be very careful before they do that. Yeah. I think uh, the bulk of the evidence would suggest, uh, would support what I've said, that, you know, the glucose is the primary fuel for many of these tumors and the ketones is is not going to be a great fuel for, for them if they can use it at all. Mm -hmm. And um, again, the space is evolving. We need better evidence in people as to what's going on. Yeah, no, that's that's perfect. Thank you. Um, Matt, what about those other strategies to help support mitochondrial function? You know, you've got cold water therapy, mm. sauna, uh, zone two exercise, and I think you gave a great, um, uh, you and Grant had a good discussion about that mm. on Precure and just the difference between um, uh, all the different um mechanisms for what's happening to mitochondria there. So is there any utility for these and do you also use them as part of your protocols? Yeah, good question. So uh, yeah, there are many different metabolic strategies. It's difficult because, you know, what exactly is optimized mitochondria function? I think fasting and keto are great because they do, we, we're pretty confident that they enhance new mitochondria, the creation of new mitochondria. They also augment the destruction of the old ones and mitochondria seem to function better in general. Uh, producing energy and so on when you apply these. Now, there are other strategies such as calorie restriction, uh, exercise, as you mentioned, uh, improving your sleep, um, hot water therapy or cold water therapy, sauna therapy and, and cold water therapy and so on that, that can also do this. I think it's uh, it's tricky, like exercise is a good one. So exercise, we know exercise, depending on what level of exercise you do and for how long, as you, I'm sure you know as well. Uh, augments uh, your mitochondria biomass. It makes more mitochondria in your muscles, and you know. However, uh, that's undeniably good for fitness. It'll help you run longer, for example, uh, or if you're a power athlete, you know, lift, lift more. Um, but is is it, it, does that enhance the? Uh, does that necessarily enhance the quality of the mitochondria to an extent that's beneficial for preventing the onset of these disorders? I think that's. Uh, hazier thing. So I, these strategies absolutely have a role. I mean, good sleep, uh, proper exercise protocol, and so on, definitely they have a role. I, I think that would be hard to argue against. That being said, uh, what kind of exercise, uh, and how long, um, what kind of quality of sleep, and how long do you need? These are, these are very important questions that need to be asked. And I guess if I was to pick one that might have the best chance of reducing uh, the onset, the progression of Alzheimer's, the progression of cancer, I would go with a fasting keto diet because they alter so much metabolism throughout the body and they can be sustained for long periods of time, whereas exercise is a very acute thing. Um, I know there's very good evidence for, you know, exercise being correlated with beneficial cancer outcomes. Can, could, could that as a standalone therapy alongside chemo or radiation be as useful as fasting? I didn't think it could. I might be wrong, uh, but um, certainly they have a role. And with these protocols, I do um, mention to people the benefits of exercise, sleep, and stress reduction, and so on. That these things can also help mitochondria. And if you can to to uh, you know gently increase these things 
it's a graded approach because with the long fast, I don't want them to exercise too hard on the first couple. So yeah, it's there's just so much unknown about it that it's uh, it's hard to make any firm recommendations really. But yeah, I just worry that people I might start uh you know taking things to an extreme that is poorly supported by evidence and uh, that maybe could be harming them in other ways. So I'm going for the therapies, the strategies, I think are the biggest bang for the buck, which for most people would be, I reckon, fasting and keto. Yeah, that's great. And of course, you'll be familiar with um, Dale Bredesen's protocol, which is very, like, there's a lot to it. Sure. Um, and um, Terry Walls is another one with her, um, the Walls protocol, which sort of at the upper end is a keto approach but of course they've sort of in and around that there is um, a whole lot of other supplemental things which which they recommend as part of their protocols is there any yeah. like how how where are you on that matt look i'm a i'm a of course a fan of of uh the work done by dr bredesen and dr walls because they're using a lifestyle oriented strategy that being said um it's very difficult to know what's going on, even if you get improvement, you know, the, the recode protocol that Dale uses, for example, is, you know, you're changing uh, 10, 15, 20, 30 different things, ideally. So not only does that require a lot of time and money, it's like, even if you get an improvement, you don't exactly know what led to the improvement. It's doubtful that every single one of the 30 things or 20 things improved the person. I'm interested in finding out what are the things that have the biggest bang for your buck. It's it's that whole Pareto principle that, you know, in any system, company, um, hospital, or therapy, 20% of the inputs are giving you 80% of the goodness of the outputs. And really it's, if someone improves on the RICO protocol and they're doing fasting keto, if those were providing 80% of the benefit and the other 18 things were giving you the extra 20%, is it worth spending all the time and money on the other 18 things if you can get it a similar result with these other things? So um, that's that's my emphasis. Is I think these are the most promising therapies for the most people. Um, I, I guess they're all, that makes it also amenable to doing randomized control trials that yes. help you show this for sure. So you... A randomized control trial, you have two groups of people that are basically the same with Alzheimer's or whatever, and you change one thing between the two groups. So one group does this diet and the other one does that diet. You follow them for three months or something. And then if one group changed compared to the other, you can be pretty confident that it was your change at the start that elicited the change at the end because nothing else changed. That's why they're so powerful. With the Recode protocol, you can't do that because if you change all 20 things and you get an improvement, like I said, you don't know which of the 20 things did the difference and uh i i believe partly for that reason anyways they're, they're having trouble getting uh approval of of a, a randomized trial for that protocol so yeah i think it's it's really great to investigate these lifestyle strategies but it's it's also very important to do it in a in a way that is meaningful in the interpretation otherwise you know you it's it's very difficult to uh to implement them practically in people and, uh, and convince your colleagues that, hey, this this works. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And as you were talking about the randomized control trials, I then thought about adherence. Can you imagine someone trying to adhere to 20 different things? I mean, that's... Yeah, Dr. Bresson himself, uh, as I, I read in one of his papers that, you know, it's, it's at least very rare, or, or, or I think it might have even been no patients, at least in his early papers, that adhere to the protocol in its entirety. The protocol is very intensive, extremely intensive, and I'm, I'm not surprised. Matt, um, if we think about, like, you know, we sort of uh, started off the conversation thinking about insulin resistance and, and, you know, diet. If you're getting a person coming to your clinic and they, um, they have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or, or Parkinson's or MS, are there any indicators in their blood markers, like usual blood markers, that might sort of go along with that? I'm curious. That indicates that they are suitable for these? Well, or insulin resistant as well. Like, so, you know, what, like, are there, is everyone you see also have an HbA1c that's near 40 or? I see. Yeah. Well, uh, pre-diabetes is so common in New Zealand, it's uh, probably at least a third of the population now. And so 
you do see a raised HbA1c frequently, but I also see a lot of normal ones. I suspect from the trial, I haven't looked at this carefully, but I have a strong suspicion that the people who have more weights and more diabetes get a better improvement in their Alzheimer's or, Par or Parkinson's or whatever the disorder is when they do these protocols. What does that mean? Not quite sure, but I've certainly seen benefits in people who are thin or don't have diabetes or prediabetes. I haven't looked at this statistically and in a rigorous fashion, so I shouldn't comment and speculate too much. But I, I don't have any biomarkers other than those things that tell me, oh, this person's going to respond well. It's it's very hard to say. I think in general, from what I've seen, most people respond well, and that's the big most, you know, vast majority, and uh, get some kind of benefit. But it's still very early days. You know, we've done these two randomized trials, one in Parkinson's, one in Alzheimer's. The Parkinson's one is still the only one in existence, and the Alzheimer's is one of two in existence. So we need a lot more trials. Yeah, absolutely. And Matt, do you think, and like, I think about, I know there are trials running with just using exogenous ketones for certain conditions uh, to, uh, you know, what impact they might have. Um, do you think that if someone couldn't do a ketogenic diet, would you like recommend they do exogenous ketones as a way to help improve, even if it means that they're in a state of just that usual sort of standard diet? Like, would would that be of benefit? Yeah, I mean that's that's a, that creates uh, there's sort of a divide in the keto community as to you know is is are exogenous ketones a good way to go or do you need the whole diet like you can't put the diet in a pill uh, and, because the diet the diet is really a method the ketogenic diet is more of a method than a diet that puts the whole body into this altered state and yeah I'm definitely in the latter group I think most of the benefits of the keto diet are not from the actual ketones themselves but from the orchestra of changes that occurs, of which one is the generation of ketones. We're aiming to restore the mitochondria. If you give someone exogenous ketones, are we going to induce the restoration of their mitochondria to any extent, especially if they're eating a standard diet? I would argue no. I have seen people try this. I have spoken to people that try this. Uh, there is the odd exception, but I, I don't get the feeling that these exogenous ketones by themselves are helping people to any tremendous degree. In fact, in our protocols, I don't use exogenous ketones. I don't use even MCT oil. We do use olive oil and coconut oil, of course, which are very ketogenic. But uh, I, I'd like to try and treat these things through a natural whole foods, real food based approach that orchestrates the body into this altered state. And I think uh, I've got nothing against using exogenous ketones or MCT oils. I just don't see them as being the crucial factor in halting this epidemic of lifestyle disease. Mm, you no, know, that's such a great answer. And as you were saying it, um, I was thinking, of course, you know, like, because it's almost like, it's like giving a pill basically, or a drug. So it's, the concept is the same. That's the band-aid approach rather than something that's actually. Mm. Or at least so, the tip of the um, iceberg approach. Yeah. Tip of the, tip of the iceberg. Um, Matt, I've just got a couple more questions. Um, Go ahead. When I talked to Chris Palmer and we talked about epilepsy and, and changes in the brain, like the ketogenic diet um, for some has the opportunity to reset the brain, actually, and reset the brain pathways. And he says that, you know, um, subsequently, of course, there are people who will need to continue to follow the approach possibly forever, but there are others that can sort of um, maybe go on and, and come off. Like, what's your understanding of... Uh, that concept when we're thinking about Alzheimer's and Parkinson's? Do we even know? Oh, well, of course, epilepsy is associated with mitochondria damage too. The best, uh, the best evidence for that is in children. That you, if you start, a, particularly young children, if you start them on a ketogenic diet and they have seizures uh, and do it for, you know, control the seizures, after one or two years, you can take them off the diet and they have, as you say, reset their brain and they have no longer got seizures, at least to the extent they had, and they they uh, are reset, and then and that's awesome. You know, the epilepsy seems to have been uh, mitigated or abolished. The, <laughs> does it happen in adults? Certainly not to the same extent. I, I guess uh, 
Although people have neuroplasticity throughout life and there are small areas of the brain that can keep creating neurons and we, you know, the brain does a, adapt, of course, to these strategies, I think most people would not would, would have to stay on the ketogenic diet or fasting protocol or whatever it is um, who are older if it works. I, I've not got a lot of good data to back that assertion up, but my clinical um, suspicion is that's the case. And um, it's it's quite easy to tell when someone falls off the wagon a bit because the seizures come back, and they do seem correlated in most cases with the ketone level. So yes, I think it does have the power to uh, certainly change your brain, reset it completely. Not sure. Now, when you talk about Alzheimer's and these other really tough disorders, these are these represent, to my way of thinking, end stage disorders of severe decades long mitochondria damage and dysfunction. Can you reset those? Uh, well, I think let's just see if we can improve them first before we talk about resetting things. I know there are books out there about the end of Alzheimer's and resetting and all this stuff, but look, it's this is these are tough conditions. Anyone who lives with Alzheimer's knows how unbelievably hard it is. And I think we should just work on trying to improve life for people first. And then, you know, we can get excited about slowing down the process or, or reversing the process if that's possible um, later. Yeah, no, that's great. Matt, is there anyone where fasting mimicking, ketogenic diet fasting would be contraindicated? So it would not be a good idea to sort of embark on these? Well, anyone who's diametrically opposed to it. Uh, is a contraindication. That means a person who's, you know, one cannot, you know, isn't psychologically wanting to do it or ready for it or, or for some other reason. So if you can't flip the psychology in the person, then that's a contraindication. It will not succeed without that. I, I can guarantee that. Other things, I guess, uh, I think fasting, everyone's ancestors evolved with periods of food restriction at some point in time. So really fasting is, is, universal. That being said, um, if someone is thin and if someone uh, is, you know, thin, thin and fit, do you need to do rigorous fasting protocols? I Probably not. You probably don't need to do multi day fasts. You probably can just get by on, you know, maybe just going two meals a day or something like that. And that's fine. Maybe a little bit of fasting would still be beneficial, but not as much as someone who's obese and has type 2 diabetes, right? Uh, keto diets, similar way of thinking. I think you have to look at where people's ancestors came from. So people who say have a, a Northern hemisphere background, so Northern Europe, Scandinavia, uh, Mongolia, Northern Asia, Northern Canada, like the Inuit, their ancestors would have evolved on a probably a, a carnivore keto diet and they would have been in ketosis the vast majority of the time. So maybe a keto diet is better for that person. Someone who whose ancestors evolved near the equator would have had a, a much higher vegetable component. There still would have been meat in there, but much higher vegetable component, perhaps more carbohydrates, perhaps not in ketosis as much. So perhaps the ketogenic diet not as rigorous uh, or essential in that person. Again, anyone who's thin and, and reasonably fit, exercises decently, the benefits will be less than the person who's sedentary, overweight, and has metabolic disorders. So you know, you can see the evidence for this throughout the world, uh, like the Okinawan diet or Southeast Asian diets, which have traditionally been high in carb and low in fat, are actually pretty good if, if people are thin and exercising and getting the carbohydrates from natural or naturalish foods with lots of fiber. And uh, that that can work well. It's just that in the current day and age in the West, where uh, most people are overweight or obese, and we have this pre-diabetes everywhere, and all these metabolic disorders, these lifestyle disorders. I think the high-fat, low-carb fasting approach is the most beneficial, but it's all contextual. There's not, it's not like I, I totally favor that over carb, and, and you know, carb, high carb, low fat can be good. The real issue again, that's definitely bad for pretty much anyone, is high carb, high fat, which is the Western diet. That is a very abnormal diet for pretty much anyone, and unless you're um, I don't know, exercising a lot and uh, probably um, burning up all of that um, tremendously, it, it's not going to be good for you. And even in that setting, I don't think it's going to be good for you long term. 
No, I agree. I'm just thinking of all the oxidative stress and damage that Correct. would occur with all of the calories going in. But I remember, of course, people who are burning a lot of energy and are athletes who are several hours of exercise, that also isn't uh, congruent with overall sort of optimal health either. Um, yeah, the exercise is one. Uh, it's a trick. That's, as you probably know, Grant and I discussed. I think just uh, if you look at it, I mean, there are different ways to interpret it, but the, the high-level ultra athletes do have uh, worse health outcomes than people who don't exercise nearly as much. They get more heart problems and kidney problems and so on. And you could, uh, I, I suspect it's just, you know, I've got hours and hours of uh, inflammation, uh, free radical production and mitochondria working overtime with insufficient healing periods in between because you might be exercising six days a week. And so you don't get these proper restorative period periods. That being said, it's a bit tricky to to, to uh, blame the exercise wholly because in the modern day and age, a lot of people who exercise a lot are drinking, uh, you know, these high carb uh, power, you know, Gatorade and all these different uh, supplemental things that are probably um, swamping the mitochondria in excess um, excess uh, nutrition as well. So, yeah, but definitely that. That's a fact that the, the the highest level exercisers, and I see these a, a person who's an ultra athlete type person every couple of months at a youngish age, fifties, say with a stroke or something like that. I see that pretty frequently, and and they always have the same question for me: Why did I get this? I'm fitter than anyone in this ward, in this hospital. And I said, Yes, you certainly are, but that doesn't make you healthy. Yeah, it's such a good point, Matt. Do you have a target? Uh, blood ketone level for people with health, for people who you work with are you are you chasing ketones is that or i don't chase them but because the ketones aren't what matters but they are a good marker of the metabolic state and i find like i said outcomes are generally better in, in all the disorders i've studied so far with higher levels so it's a question of feasibility for that person feasibility for that person's disorder and um, again, the people who have more fat on them and women also ha can get higher ketones. So the the thin uh, man is the person who has the most difficulty getting the ketones up. Uh, the overweight woman has the easiest time. And of course, age is helpful too. Younger people get them up easier. I guess when I'm fighting an aggressive, we're fighting an aggressive disorder such as glioblastoma, we're aiming for high ketones. So sort of on the keto diet, we want them to be at least two. And when they're fasting, you don't really, I mean, you can only, they'll only go as high as they do, but they're, they're going to go into the threes, fours, fives, sixes, sevens. Conversely, someone with the Alzheimer's or Parkinson's type disorders, uh, those people in our trials averaged about one. Would I've liked them to be at a two? Yes. But one's still pretty good. Uh, ketosis starts at about 0.5 or 0.6. So, and and people with these neurodegenerative disorders, of course, there are many other behavioral things that you're you have to take into account that make make life difficult. And they're older, and many of them are thin, and it's not so easy uh, to do it to even to do the psychological mind flip, like I mentioned, in someone with a disorder like that. So that's probably my guide. Uh, aggressive disorders need higher ketones. Um, Less aggressive, more protracted disorders, maybe lower ketones can help uh, as yeah. well. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. And finally, what do you tell people who are sort of, you know, mid 30s, early 40s, generally healthy, like with regards to, um, and they have a pretty well balanced diet? Would you like, what is your recommendation for those people with regards to the prevention of these conditions? If, if there is, you know, anything yeah. that you might. Yeah. So, so far we've been talking about um, how to use these strategies for people with the disorders. Can you prevent them? I'm, I think you can. In theory, if you keep your mitochondria healthy, you really, if this perspective is right, it's quite exciting because you shouldn't really get the vast majority of cancers. You shouldn't really get Alzheimer's or you know, all these other disorders. And uh, I guess in that setting, all I can say is I put my money where my mouth is. I I eat once a day, usually, sometimes twice, maybe two days a week, twice. It's a ketogenic diet completely for almost the last seven years. And I do a four or five day fast every two to three months. And do I have any disorders at all? No, none. Uh, do I ever get sick? No, never. You know, all my colleagues have been 
afflicted by COVID-19 and all these other things. And I just, you know, marched through without any issues. So I think uh, if you want to have optimal health, and that's a good thing, then yes, I'd support this in people in their 20s, 30s, 40s. Of course, if you're doing, the only exception would be people who are uh, competing uh, for something that requires a certain level of fitness that you need to do a dietary change to to get that level. So uh, powerlifting or something would be a great example. It's if you want to build that much muscle uh, to really compete at a high level, uh, can you use you know you're probably going to have to to, to introduce carbohydrates at least in a, in a punctuated intermittent fashion to do that. Uh, you probably don't want to be doing extended fasting if you want to do that. But that's a different goal. That's not a health goal. That's a fitness goal. So. Yeah, in general, I'd say definitely if you want to enhance your cognition and um, your uh, ability to perform on a functional level, physically and mentally, day to day, improve your sleep and so on, and then give yourself more time because when you eat once a day, you've got a lot more time, then yeah, go for sure. it. Yeah. yeah. Matt, that was awesome. Like you really covered pretty much all of my questions, despite the fact that I've got like a million more. Um, can you let people know where they can find you? Yeah, sure. I've got a website at metabolicneurologist.com. So we've got a, a metabolic plan there that is sort of a general two meal a day keto diet plan that I use in a lot of patients, and which I basically eat myself, by the way. Uh, our major papers are there, some videos, podcasts, such as this one will be there. And uh, if people need to contact me, the link is there too. I'm starting to get a lot of emails, so I'm not sure how viable it is to continue that. But uh, for the moment, yeah, you can reach me through that. That is awesome. Dr. Matt Phillips, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. Alrighty, hopefully you enjoyed that episode as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. And next week on the podcast, I speak to Ryan O'Connor, optometrist, all about the importance of vascular health and eye health and his work in this field. And he's also a podcaster. He's been podcasting for many years at the Stag Raw podcast. Such a fun conversation. I think you're really going to love it. Until then, though, you can catch me over on Facebook at Mickey Willardin Nutrition, over on Instagram and Twitter at Mickey Willardin, or on my website, MickeyWillardin.com, where you can sign up to my weekly email, you can sign up to one of my online programs, or book a one-on-one -on -one consult with me. All right, team, enjoy the rest of your week. Speak soon.